Welcome to my channel, where the scariest stories come to life. Before we dive into today's chilling tale, make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications, so you never miss a story. Now, let's get into the horror. I grew up in a small mining town in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. When I was a kid, the town was still quite small, holding only about 3,000 people. To give you an idea of the area, the town is basically dry, arid brushland with desert further out. It has a dam with some other water sources nearby, but also has massive expanses with not much in between them. One day, my schoolmates were bragging about riding their push bikes all the way to a roadhouse on the Great Northern Highway, which sits roughly halfway between our town and the next town over. The roadhouse is about a two to two and a half hour drive, with the speed limit mostly set at 110 kilometers an hour. However, there were tons of hills along the way, and the sun in the Pilbara is blistering hot. Because of this, riding your push bike there as a 13 or 14 year old would be virtually impossible without some serious preparation. You would likely need rest stops, water, and some sort of transportable shade, at the very least, to even stand a chance of making this trip. So when they claimed they had made this trip with nothing more than their school uniforms and water from a puddle on the way, I knew they had to be lying. I decided to put their ringleader in his place. The guy was the only other one in my school my size and was better at sports, and he never let me forget that. So you can imagine, putting him in his place was something I really wanted to do. Thinking he was full of it, I challenged him, in front of 20 or so kids who might as well have been his unofficial fan club, to do the ride again, this time with me. I planned to take supplies in case he decided to give up on replicating his feat of living off the land like a true trailblazing pioneer. At this point, I thought he'd back out and give me some sort of excuse for not doing it again. But to my shock, he accepted the offer to do the ride with me. To my even greater surprise, he showed up at the beginning of the ride on Saturday morning with nothing more than his clothes and a water bottle filled up only a quarter of the way. Trying to one-up each other, we idiotically kicked things off at a fast pace. A half hour later, we were starting to get tired, and I was beginning to lag behind. Further down, we eventually came to a winding area of the road, at which point I lost him around a bend. Feeling absolutely buggered, I decided to stop for a rest. After about 10 minutes, I continued on, pushing with all I had. Panic started setting in when I hit a long straightaway and there was still no sign of my friend. I became worried, he could have collapsed from dehydration, or worse, a couple of minutes up the road. That thought kept me going. As time went on, I became too tired to ride my bike uphill and decided to walk it instead. The road was so hot that I could feel it through my shoes. I began to feel guilty the longer I went without finding the boy I had started riding with. What if something had happened? What if I had gotten him killed? After more searching, my mind had convinced me that he was dead because of me. About a half hour later, I was coasting back when I saw a small goat track leading to a crop of trees where I decided to take shelter from the heat. Most of the way down the track, I saw a familiar bike. Hope rising within me, I began calling out for my rival. I eventually found him sitting up against a tree, his throat too parched to make any real sound. I gave him my bottle of water, which he drank too fast and spent the next couple of minutes coughing and sputtering. We were both absolutely rooted at this point. After resting for a while, we walked our bikes back to the road, where we were lucky enough to be rescued by a guy driving a UTA, a utility vehicle, which is the Australian equivalent of a pickup truck. Upon our arrival back, we went to my parents' house, where we played Sega for about three hours before my now friend finally headed home. I collapsed at four in the morning and only woke up around nine when my mom checked to see if I was okay. And here's the kicker, I never told my parents what really happened. I lied and said we'd been building jumps at the bike track in the bush all day. Over lunch on Monday, my new friend left his mates and found me, asking if I wanted to play Foursquare with them. His friends thought he was going to make a fool of me about the entire ride, but I just nodded and accepted his invite. And that was that, we never became close friends, 
but after that, he respected me and stopped encouraging the other guys to give me a hard time. We both eventually became part of this silly initiative the school was pushing, called the school council. He became the rec guy, and I became the environmental guy. We never truly forgot that day of writing, though. One night, when I was around 8 or so, I had gone to bed early, because I had school in the morning. I slept pretty well that night, all things considered, but I woke up out of a sound sleep at some point in the wee hours. I didn't have an alarm clock at this point in time, so there's no telling what time it was. All I knew was that the sky was black outside my window. In any case, I woke up to the feeling of being watched. I thought it might be one of my little brothers standing by my bed, as they tended to come to me instead of my parents for comfort when they had nightmares in the middle of the night. I didn't feel threatened or scared in any way, but I slowly cracked my eyes open to see who was there. There was nothing. I opened my eyes all the way, and only then did I notice what looked like the outline of a thin, older male with glasses and a long-sleeved shirt on. The odd part was that this image was completely see-through, except for the outline of his body, glasses, and clothes, which glowed in several shades of blues and greens that shimmered and shifted like the northern lights. Even though I had no knowledge of the northern lights at this stage of my life, that's the best way I can describe it. He just stood there with a soft smile on his face, about a foot away from the side of my bed, watching me. My father had been known to come in and check on us kids at night sometimes, so I sleepily asked, Papa, thinking this was the case. The next thing I knew, it was morning, and Mom was waking me up to get us all ready for the bus. I asked my dad if he'd checked on us during the night, but he denied it. He listened to my story, but said nothing in reply, probably chalking it up to dreams or my imagination, but I know what I saw. Years later, I brought it up again at my dad's house, and he seemed to think it may have been the spirit of my great-great-grandfather, who'd passed away the month before I was born. Our great-great-grandma was still around, so when I had the chance, I asked her about her husband. She described a thin, spectacled man who was sweet as could be, always with a smile on his face. She proceeded to tell me that he'd passed away from lung cancer, but had he had the chance to meet us, he would have spoiled my brothers and me rotten. Knowing this, I'm certain that's who came to visit me that night. My mother married a highly successful businessman in 1988. This man was from a prominent local family who owned a funeral parlor. The businessman owned a painting franchise retail store and an interior design company. He was also a master carpenter who eventually opened his own Civil War reproduction artillery shop, where he would build antique cannons for the National Park Service, as well as for individual investors. Needless to say, the man was entranced with history, and he would often visit Colonial Williamsburg, which led him to build several homes in our Kentucky city patterned after historical buildings and plantation homes, inspired by his visits to the Virginia colony. This leads me to my story. It was October of 1992 when my parents, having recently finished building an impressive three-story plantation home on the outskirts of town, decided to buy a piece of property downtown in an antiquated suburb surrounded by mansions and structures that had been a part of the city for well over 100 years. This area of town came complete with an old stone church and was within walking distance of our famous Central Park. The property my parents bought was small, but the house was massive, sitting at almost 6,000 square feet, with three levels and a basement. Curiously, the house was divided into four apartments. The current owner, a local minister, had segmented the house in such a manner that he lived alone on the first floor. The second floor housed three individual apartments, with a back staircase for access, completely separate from his living space on the first floor. The third floor was entirely empty, having previously been a ballroom for the original occupants before being destroyed by a fire in 1922, and it had never been reclaimed afterward. At this point, I was a 16-year-old honor student, and I was completely clean and sober. I even used to lecture people about the dangers of drinking and smoking, which is ironic as I'm 42 now and no stranger to drugs and alcohol. At the time, however, I was a party virgin, so I wasn't under the influence of anything but self-preservation. 
Now my story can truly begin. As a 16-year-old male, I constantly butted heads with my stepfather. We graded against one another from time to time. When I found out about the recent property purchase, I knew they weren't going to move in until the place was in good enough condition to accommodate the entire family, five of us, including two dogs and a cat. Knowing this and wanting some peace and quiet, I asked my family if I could move into one of the apartments for some space. Much to my surprise, they agreed. So a couple of buddies and I moved all my stuff out of the house and into the new apartment as quickly as possible before my family could change their minds. I had never taken the time to check the apartment out, so when we arrived with the key and our stuff, I was completely overwhelmed. The house was massive. It was totally gothic, stone pillars, black iron fence, stained glass windows, two staircases, four outside entrances, and it was painted blood red. I was quite surprised my stepfather had bought the place, as it wasn't the least bit colonial and didn't resemble the southern plantation homes I was used to. Still, I was, and still am, big into horror movies, so being able to live in a house like this by myself for at least a few months was the coolest thing ever. My enthusiasm was hindered by one thing, the only working phone line was in the basement. Soon after moving all my stuff into my second-floor dwelling and my buddies departing, I tried to settle into my new surroundings, old hardwood floors, chipped paint, faulty lighting. But as the sun went down, I started to feel uneasy. The realization hit me that I was going to be alone in this colossal, rundown mansion with bad pipes, bad lighting, and no way of communicating with anyone, as cell phones weren't a thing yet. Trying not to dwell on it, I took the skeleton key and locked all the doors before heading to the subway for a BLT. Upon returning and letting myself in, I noticed all the doors were standing ajar by an inch. Nervous, I made my way to the apartment with what little light was available, as the light in the hallway was now off. Locking myself in my new abode, I began eating my sandwich. Eventually, I headed back out with a flashlight and my skeleton key to relock all the doors. Once again, I felt really isolated in the house, yet I could never shake the feeling of being watched. I soon headed back to my apartment, hooked up my stereo and DVD player, and started watching a movie. About half an hour into the film, I heard someone coming up the stairs, so I paused the movie. Nothing. I waited, listened intently for a few minutes, but still nothing. Feeling paranoid, I took my flashlight and key and made my way to the upper corridor. Once again, I found every door unlocked and opened by an inch. Feeling the need for backup, I locked my apartment and left. I headed to my best friend's workplace, Blockbuster, and told him what was going on. He informed me his shift ended at 11, and he'd come over to my place afterward. After his shift, we headed back to my apartment and locked ourselves inside. At about 12.30 a.m., I heard the sound of someone coming up the stairs again. This was soon followed by an unbearable silence. Dusty, my friend, got up and armed himself with an American cavalry sword, I realize how stupid this sounds, before we both made our way into the upper hall. Once again, every door was ajar, by an inch. We decided to make a clean sweep of the entire house, except for the basement, locking every door behind us as we did. At about 1 a.m., we finished our sweep and returned to my room. For the remainder of the night, we heard footsteps, and neither of us could sleep. Checking things again in the morning, we found all the doors unlocked and open by an inch. Now comes the scary part. Later that day, after school, I went back to eat dinner with my family at their house. During the meal, my mother asked how my night went. Trying not to sound like a coward, I told my family I loved the place, especially the peace and quiet from my siblings and overbearing stepfather. My mom then gave me a puzzled look. You didn't sound too good over the phone, she said. What are you talking about? I asked. She then said, I called you last night, and you sounded odd. I asked her what she meant and informed her I had never gone into the basement, nor did I hear the phone ring at all that night. My mother then told me not to scare my little brothers like that. To this day, she swears she spoke to me on the phone that night. 
I never answered the phone, Dusty never answered the phone, and neither of us heard it ring. I'm not sure what happened, but one thing is clear, something answered the phone that night, and it wasn't us. This happened a few years ago when I was new to the army. I had finished basic training and completed my job training when I received two separate orders from the army, both of which were soon cancelled, leaving me stuck waiting for new orders. One day, while hoping something would come in, the training platoon sergeant came in and called out my name along with another guy's. The sergeant asked if we had our berets, ID cards, and wallets. We said yes, and we were told to report to the staff duty van. Once we arrived, another sergeant told us we were going to be battle buddies for a soldier they were picking up from a hospital. We got in and started driving. Initially, we thought we were going to the base hospital, but we kept driving and headed for the front gate. Okay, I thought, we're probably going to the hospital in town. But instead, we turned and drove out of town entirely. Finally, the sergeant pulled into a gas station and turned back to us. The sergeant informed us that we were going to Phoenix to pick up a soldier. Then he said, if you need a snack, a drink, or to use a latrine, do so now or forever hold your peace. Ten minutes later, we were back on the road. When we finally arrived in Phoenix, we had to search for the particular clinic at the hospital. We circled the campus twice, before finally finding the entrance. After parking, we were sent back to the van. Soon after, a guard inspected us for weapons, checking for guns, sharp objects, and anything that could be used as a blunt weapon. After the inspection, we made our way into the waiting area. There were double doors behind us with a large guy, a former linebacker in hospital scrubs, standing nearby. To the right was a waiting area with tables and vending machines. To the left, there was a door leading to a small office behind plexiglass. Straight ahead was a set of double doors with electronic locks and signs that read, no visitors beyond this point. The sergeant went to talk to the people in the plexiglass office, while my buddy and I sat at a table. After about five minutes of arguing with the staff, they took the sergeant back beyond the security doors. My buddy and I waited around for another 15 minutes, watching the hospital staff go about their business. Then, we heard a commotion near the front entrance. Some cops were hauling in a man who was thrashing violently. One of the cops spotted us and asked for help holding the man down. My buddy and I looked at each other before deciding to help. I swear my buddy shouted, Leroy Jenkins, before we tackled the man and held him down. The man was thrashing around and moaning about being hungry and needing to eat. After what was likely only a minute, but felt like hours, the staff came out and stuck the man with a needle, which put him to sleep. Once he'd settled down, they strapped him to a gurney. One of the cops talked to a lady on the staff, while another came over to talk to us. The man we had tackled was a homeless guy who had been wandering the neighborhood, attacking residents. The cops had tossed him before arresting him, and it was clear he needed to be evaluated. We mentioned the bite marks, and one of the staff members said two words that sent chills through the room, Wendigo psychosis. The cop said, what? The staff member explained that people suffering from Wendigo psychosis go crazy and develop a craving for human flesh. She added, think of it like those Ted Bundy serial killer types. After that, things finally settled down. About 15 minutes later, the sergeant returned with the private we were supposed to escort. My buddy and I briefly wondered if we'd have to wrestle this guy too, but all the private said was, hi. Soon after, we headed back to base, and the rest of the trip was uneventful. I'm 18 years old and live in northern Canada, splitting my time between two homes. One is with my father, who lives right in the middle of 222 acres of woods. We've got just one neighbor, about a kilometer away. My other home is with my mother, on the edge of a city near the woods and a shopping center. The story I'm about to share is divided into three parts, and while it may sound unbelievable, I swear it's all true. The first part of the story takes place at my father's house. I often go for walks in the woods. It's peaceful and quiet. 
I always bring my three dogs along for protection, a German Shepherd and two Australian Shepherds. At first, nothing out of the ordinary ever happened during these walks. Occasionally, I'd spot a bear or find some lynx tracks, but nothing more than that. However, one day I started feeling as though something was watching me from the woods, a black figure of sorts. At first, I thought it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, so I shrugged it off. A few days passed since I first felt this strange presence. It was a cold day with the sun hidden, and a northern wind made the temperature even more biting. Around noon, I took the dogs out for a walk down the road leading to my house. The world was still, the only sound was the wind rustling the trees. I was calm, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. Of course, my dogs were with me, but this sensation was different, darker. When I returned home, the house was empty. As I was about to bring the dogs into their kennel, I noticed one of the Aussies had frozen in place, staring into the woods. I called his name, but he wouldn't budge. I walked over to him, patted his head, but he only growled, not at me, but toward whatever was out in the trees. His pacing, tail tucked between his legs and ears laid back, made me uneasy. The fact that my dog could sense what I was feeling confirmed I wasn't imagining it. I locked the door when I got inside, hoping the feeling would pass. But it didn't. If anything, it grew worse. Every night, I had to lock the doors and cover the windows, as if something was outside peering in. I told a few people about it, including those I lived with. They suggested it might be a bear, a ghost, or even a stalker. None of that seemed to fit. It didn't feel right. Fast forward about three months to September. The weather was getting colder, and one day I was outside with the dogs, cleaning some skulls I'd recently gotten from a trapper. My family was out, leaving me alone. As I worked, I felt the dark presence again near the forest. It was strange, yet I couldn't shake it off. I went inside to make myself some food, and the fear left for a moment, until I heard it. The most dreadful sound I've ever heard in my life came from the woods outside, a mix of a man screaming, a deer howling in pain, and the low growl of a bear. I immediately checked all the doors and ran to the second floor to hide. I wasn't sure why I felt so much fear, especially since I didn't hear the sound again. Still, I called a relative, who assured me I was just hearing things. But that night, I could barely sleep, afraid whatever it was might come inside. I kept seeing shapes in the shadows of the trees. After that, the presence was impossible to ignore. Eventually, I moved in with my mother in the city, partly for a better job opportunity, but also to be closer to friends. Not long after the move, I reunited with my childhood best friend, and one night we decided to take a walk. It was a cold evening, and as we walked and talked, Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, until 11.30 p.m. when we were crossing the street. I heard the same sound from the woods, but this time it was louder, closer. I froze in terror, but my friend didn't seem to notice. We kept walking, but I was more paranoid now, constantly scanning the dark, half expecting something to jump out at me. After an hour, we parted ways. I headed home, listening to instrumental music on my phone to calm my nerves. That didn't last long. As I walked down the empty street, I heard something that chilled me to the bone, a baby's scream, but it wasn't normal. It was distorted, horrifying. I glanced toward the direction of the sound and saw what I thought was a figure standing in the shadows. Fear took over, and I started walking faster. Then, I heard another scream, louder, more terrifying than the first. I ran, my instincts taking over, even though I knew running might not be the best idea. I heard footsteps behind me, pounding against the pavement. I looked back and caught a glimpse of a large black figure pursuing me, but it vanished after only a few seconds. The screams didn't stop, though. I finally made it home, only to find the door locked. Panicking, I called my stepfather and rang the doorbell over and over until he opened it. I was a hyperventilating mess, but I got through it. I'm very spiritual, 
and I've been told by mediums and spiritual leaders that I'm a beacon for negative spirits. I initially assumed that was what I was dealing with. But then I remembered reading about Wendigos, creatures connected to human cravings and madness. After doing more research, I began to believe that whatever had been following me could be one of these entities. I don't know for sure if it's a Wendigo, but something is still watching me. And I can't help but wonder what it wants and what it's planning to do next. Thanks for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed the story, don't forget to give the video a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a terrifying tale. See you in the next one.